All right, welcome to another segment of SIP, Shelter in Place. We are absolutely thrilled to have with us this evening, Nick Goldschmidt. And Nick would really need no introduction, but I'm gonna try my best to give him an introduction. And it's not gonna be wine related. It's going to be pretty much kind of golf related. So inter introducing Nick is similar to a PGA tournament I saw years ago when Tiger and Phil were playing with each other. And when people at the PGA Tour get to the first tee, they introduce who you are and the tournaments you have won. So they introduced Phil Mickelson first, and Phil at this point in time had won about three or four tournaments, and then Phil graciously waved to the crowd, stepped aside, and then they introduced Tiger. And Tiger had won at this point in time three or four Masters, several PGA tournaments, Bay Hill, and it went on and on and on, introducing Tiger Woods to the point to where finally Phil said, enough already. And the crowd got a, a very big laugh out of it, but it really is that way introducing Nick Goldschmidt because Nick has actually done just about everything in the world of wine that one could possibly do. He's made wine uh, in his home country of New Zealand. He's made wine in Australia. He's made wine down in South America, in Argentina, in Chile. He's made wine in Guadalupe Valley. Valley, Valley. He's made wine really all over the place, and not just any wines, but spectacular wine. He was instrumental in developing, for all intents and purposes, if you look it up, Nick really put California Cabernet Sauvignon on the map uh, with his 13 years at CIMI. So, so Nick, I'm humbled to be able to share some time with you, uh, metaphorically share a glass of wine with you, and hopefully you found that corkscrew. Uh, oh, outstanding, perfect. But uh, welcome to Cellar Angels. Welcome to this evening's event. And thank you so much for spending some of your Friday with us. Oh, no, you're more than welcome. I had nothing else to do. I'm stuck in my closet. I can't travel. I mean, I normally travel nine months a year and, uh, and uh, I'm not doing that right now. So I'm stuck at home with option B. <laughs> option B. Well, option B, you get to be with uh, myself, Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels. And for those of you that are new to this, Seller Angels is a direct-to-consumer company that's been around since 2010, going on our 10th year. We feature exclusively Napa and Sonoma wines that, for the most part, you can't get because they're small production wines that are in limited availability. Very seldom will they be outside um, available at the, at the winery themselves. And it gives us an opportunity, considering what Nick just said, that we're all in closets, we're all sheltering, we're all starving for some engagement. And just because we physically distance doesn't mean we have to socially distance. So this is our little effort to get together, learn a little bit about some fantastic wines. And Nick, I mean, right off the bat, as I mentioned, 30, 40 plus years of prolific winemaking. And I, I do want to go back to, I know you left New Zealand in I think 1983, close? Uh, I sort of flicked backwards and forwards between New Zealand and Australia. My first vintage was 82. Uh, officially, but I still was halfway through my second degree at that point. And then I did two more degrees in Australia because I hadn't discovered winemaking by then. So we would go backwards and forwards, you know, because harvest, a lot of winemakers just pursue harvests as they start careers. So, you know, that's in the Northern Hemisphere, that's September, October. And in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, that's March, April. So right. we could normally do the school year and do the vintage and go back to school, you know, so... But my whole idea really was I'm a, I'm a sailor and a skier. So my ah. whole idea about, about becoming a winemaker was so I could sail in the summer and ski in the winter. It didn't quite work out like that because the hemispheres, you know, because I, I was just in Chile and Argentina last month, of course, and New Zealand. Um, so it doesn't quite work like that if you work both hemispheres. You don't have time to do the uh, one or the other, you know. Well, so if 83, was, and I'll get back to the sailing and skiing because those are two awesome pastimes and hobbies. If 83 was the first vintage, something had to serve as kind of a catalyst to get you into that. And, and I'm curious, what was it that caused you to even want to pursue something in wine? Well, remember in those days, 1982, there's a couple of things. Firstly, there was no wine schools or viticultural schools in New Zealand at the time. Secondly, all wineries in Australia and New Zealand were basically in, um, you know, there were family businesses. So in New Zealand, it was mainly the Yugoslavs and in Australia, it was mainly the Germans. And <laughs> so it was just, an, you know, it was a family business that just went on. It was very un unusual 
to have somebody from outside of that family business to come in. And I can basically tell you the five original non-family winemakers in New Zealand. I still know the other four. Um, was and uh, just so eighty two had the judgment of Paris. Did that impact anything? Did that serve as kind of or was it? Never um, heard of it. Never heard of the judgment of Paris until so they came to Napa and you know they pushed that thing. Who no, we didn't know anything about judgment. We don't believe anything the French say anyway. I understood. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Brubaker on from Colorado enjoying the Hillary last night and also tonight. So we're gonna get to a little bit in-depth discussion on the Hillary, so that's fantastic. And also uh, William Best, thank you so much, sir, for jumping in. He is <laughs> Bill is a very terrific customer and wonderful gentleman and of ours and friend of ours, but he actually got the Hillary and then had the wherewithal to, to call me and say, I need more of this. So we took care of him and obliged and sent him a case of the Hillary. So, so skiing as, as a young man, skiing and sailing and, and kind of work the work mother nature into your purview so that you can ski at some point in time and then sail. And then the winemaking interrupted that. Yeah, well, it was, uh, you know, you bump into the wine business is a real people business. And, you know, I, as you know, Martin, I worked uh, 27 years. I was chief winemaker of Louis Vuitton Steel Wines. I was chief winemaker of Constellation when it was a much smaller company. <laughs> and then I went on to run Allied de Mac and Jim Beam. That was 58 wineries in seven countries. And, and so I got that piece. But prior to that, what you were asking is how I got into it. I met a guy called Dr. David Jackson. Unfortunately, he passed away last year, English gentleman. And he was really the first guy that was doing integrated pest management and horticulture. And he just happened to be growing grapes at Lincoln University where I was studying horticulture. And that's what got me into it. So through David Jackson, and then obviously my big um, mentor in New Zealand winemaking was a guy called Joe Babbage. Uh, Babbage oh, sure. I, was, I yep. was a winemaker at Babbage for three years. And then, of course, when I came to the U.S., uh, my mentor uh, was Zama Long, who she is. She was the second female graduate out of UC Davis. She was the first Mondavi, non-Mondavi winemaker at Mondavi. And she became president of CME when I became winemaker. She was also the first winemaker in California to do barrel fermented Chardonnay. No one had ever done that before. And so in the 80s and 90s, she was probably the most prolific, most famous winemaker in California. Unfortunately, people don't remember who she is much anymore, but people of my generation certainly remember her. And um, I still see her quite often, and especially her husband, Phil Fries, who uh, has gone on to, um, he used to be the vineyard manager of Mondavi. And so he and I worked together on a number of projects as well. So... Then I had the opportunity to work with Michelle Rolland for 12 years. At the time, he, had, he didn't speak any English. We were the first winery he worked for outside of Bordeaux, outside of Pomerol. And so uh, I could, I've continued to meet. They were solid mentors. The people that I yeah. meet now are completely crazy. <laughs> like, uh, I work for um, Martin's Lane up in Canada. It's owned by uh, Anthony Von Mandel. He's gone on to create White Claw, of all things. So I work, oh. for, I work for Eduardo Chadwick. Uh, I work, I've been working for Eduardo Chadwick and the Chadwick family now for 30 something years. You know, this year we've had, uh, this is our fifth year of 100 Point Wines uh, from James Suckling. And I used to work for his father, him, and now his daughter. So I've had three generations. I mean, just, Beautiful people, crazy, passionate. It doesn't matter what they're talking about. They're passionate about everything. And so I really enjoy these crazy people because they give me inspiration. So as old as I am and as many vintages as I've done, these people every day, you know, these guys are in their 70s and they still wake up every morning and they're pounding the streets and they're having fun and they're driven and they want to like, Nick, we've got to do this. We've got to do that. Time's running out, you know. I'm not patient anymore. I've got to get it done. You know, so these people I, I meet with and hang with all the time. And, it, and I don't know. I love it. It's no, and, and you're right. And there, and there is, and all of us, as we get up there in years, there does seem to be a heightened sense of urgency with everything we do. So, and I think that's just wisdom. And so we recognize, okay, time is in fact fleeting. You know, you can make many, many fortunes over your life and lose many fortunes over your life, but you just can't make more time. So, so the time that we have to spend with each other should be quality time. So I, I love the passion that these folks have. And I, I also love the passion that you bring to winemaking. And I'm thrilled 
that, that you've settled on at least one area partially to make wine is in Sonoma and actually Napa. And what is about, because you, you came there very early on, and, and what was it, was it the, the soil type? Was it the microclimates? Was it oh, elevation? Oh. Was it all of it? Was it all BS no, no, or no, you, no. Just, you just got lucky because someone hired you? No, the funny, well, the funny thing was, so when I got the job, Paul Hobbs had left Simi. So when Dave Ramey, Paul Hobbs, me. So Paul had left the job. I walked into Simi. I had 200 Cabernets in front of me from the 1985 vintage. 85 was one of the most spectacular vintages. When was the last time you had a really good bottle of New Zealand Cabernet? I'm that, still waiting. That would be like, never. There is yeah, no still, such thing. Still waiting. I'm waiting for you to introduce it to me. Yeah, so I had 200 wines. It took me three months to make the reserve, semi reserve cab for 75 bucks. And that's when I thought this is going to be an easier way. That's when I started realizing, you know, we sort wines into families. And so on your tongue, there's three sorts of wines that make a wine complex. So for me, the elegant wines, which are the soft berry fruit wines right up on front of the tongue there, the red fruit. Then you've got the, the black fruit, which are more powerful and rich. And then you've got the dense wines, which provide structure and finish. And when you have those three things together, that's what we call complexity. And that's why trying to find a vineyard, a vineyard, just one vineyard, that you can get all three of those elements in one vineyard is tricky. And that's why finding the best vineyards is hard. It's easy to make a blend by blending across various vineyards or various appellations or various varietals. That's, a, that's, a easy, that's an easy sport. But trying right. to find complexity from one estate is key. And, and Hillary is that state. And... It, it's in a very famous area, and I can show you a quick video of it, but it's also... Well, before you, I, I do want to see that video. And before you do that video, I want to ask the audience our first question. Because uh, you talked about complexity, so we're going to pull them and, and see uh, how the type, uh, which of the following offers the greatest impact on a wine's complexity. So now this poll is open. So if everyone is on their phone, which I doubt they're doing this, but if you're on your computer, uh, what of the following offers the greatest impact on a wine's complexity? Is it the type of barrel? Is it the vineyard source? Is it the age of the vines? I'm going to leave this open. We've got 38% uh, of the people have answered, 44%. We're going to let that get up to 60%, uh, 61%. Okay. Uh, we're going to end the polling in five, four, three, to 72%, 77% of the people have voted. All right. What was the answer? The answer is uh, 71% chose vineyard source as the greatest impact on a wine's complexity. Mm. So, so do we have a smart audience or a lucky audience? I could argue against that. I could argue against all three and I could argue for all three. The barrel one would be hard because Obviously, with Cabernet, we don't do barrel fermentation. If you do barrel fermentation, it's a special technique that we use in Australia, and mainly with Syrah. But the problem is you get more Britannomyces that way because you get a rag them. But the vineyard source, yeah, if you have the right vineyard, you can get a complex um, thing. But the caveat is the age of the vine is very important. And we all talk, you know, we all know about old vine Zinfandel. But right. I've been spouting old vine Chardonnay for a number of years and old vine Cabernet sort of fits in there too. The minimum year for me to make a uh, wine from a, from a vine is seven and I prefer 20. So once it hits 20 years, the vines tend to be in natural balance. The economic lifespan in a large company like Constellation is 30 years. So if we can go beyond 30 years, that means you chose right, you're in a good location, you got enough soil but the, the the big problem that we've got these days martin is the disease pressure so really? Pierce's disease with with blue green sharpshooters is a real problem we're getting a lot of death uh you typer and dead arm is a real big issue because of the way people prune you know you pay for wombats you get wombats you've got to like make sure that you have the best pruning people out there that understand how to prune because these really? vines, these vineyards are getting younger and younger and younger because of the mismanagement so I, the I don't know how familiar our audience is with the phrase, if you pay for wombats, you get wombats. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the American terminology is. It's very, it's very <laughs> easy to argue in Australia because we, we say the New Zealanders moving to Australia increased the IQ of both countries. I don't know, without question. I love it. I think in America, we probably stay garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't pay attention on the front end, you're going to get crap on the back end. 
There but I go. like I like hiring wombats. You're going to get wombats. Um, so I, and I agree with you, by the way, on on the age of the vines, and I think it's fascinating that the and you you know this all too well. I mean, the pressure economically in in America, specifically California, for a ton of cluster production on the vine to produce from an economic standpoint more of juice versus in Bordeaux, I believe that the average age of vines in Bordeaux is something in the vicinity of 34, 35 years. That would never happen in California. No, 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 no. That's all bullshit. Really? What it is, is these, these vineyards were planted 34, 35 years, whatever the average is. But in France, when they get a type of vine or a virus vine or whatever, they pull it out and they put a new one in. They don't have, when you replant something, that's starting from day, that, that's starting from scratch. But when you interplant, so you've got young vines intermixed with old vines. And I've been doing that at my house over the last two days. I've got a, I live down by the river. And so I've been, I've got an old, a really old Merlot vineyard down there. And it's just dynamite. And there's no way I want to pull it out because the, the irrigation is good. The trellising is good. The vines that are there are good. The root systems are great. And I've got enough water holding capacity there. So, and the rows are planted in the right direction. Now, if, if I thought the rows were wrong and the irrigation and trellising and everything was bad, yes, I'd rip it out and replant. But if you've got it right the first time, you should never have to replant. All you need to do is continue to replant the dead and missing vines. And this is why the average age of French vineyards is bullshit. You know, it's... Um, because they they mixing young vines with old vines all the time, and I, I I don't think it's a bad I don't think it's a bad solution. I think right. it's a good solution. So then, how do you explain, you know, driving up and down twenty nine in Napa, which you've done a million times, where you see vineyards that are not that old, all torn up and replanted? Could be disease, uh, but they just seem very young vines that are 12, 15 years of age. That, okay, time to get younger vines in that are more cluster producing no all bullshit yeah well that's because it's a long complicated question there's a big difference between mass selections field selections and clones so pre-1990 all those vineyards are mass selections and i could talk all day about mass selections and clones but today they plant clones because the rootstock that the french had sold us was originally axr1 when we put the mass selections on top they were related they were both vitis spinifera we okay. thought the rootstock was Vitis Nebraska, but it wasn't. It was Vitis vinifera. So when we had these things on top, they worked. When we had phylloxera, we had to get rid of the rootstock, and we had to use Vitis Nebraska. When we put the mass selections on top, we got virus. And so a lot of those vineyards have been pulled out, and they put in clones. Now, remember that they use clones for yield and sugar accumulation mm. because um, – they want to ripen big crops quickly. And so a lot of, unfortunately in Napa, because we have some unusual people in Napa, of course, that they have chosen that, that yield is a big deal. Because remember, a lot of these guys are selling their grapes. They're not actually, they don't actually own the vineyards, you know? Yep. Well, you, you talked about, and by the way, someone in the stream says, hey, there's an Aussie here. So, uh, dude. Can we delete that guy? Can we, uh, is there some way I can, un can we can dump that person? <laughs> uh, it's Lisa. We can probably, no, we're going to keep Lisa. She's welcome, Lisa. We're, we're all fair in love and war and wine. Yeah, it's, it's Anzac Day. <laughs> she got it right. She says, where does Nick live? She, she wants to have a word with you. Where does Nick live? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I just discovered I have a house. <laughs> I Which normally live point. in Chile. Yeah. I live in Chile. I live in Chile three months a year. I live in Canada for two months a year. I live in New Zealand for a month a year, and the rest of the time I live on planes in the U.S. Basically. So okay, you're a, a, a major traveler now. You're stuck at home, but I, I like the fact that you talked about vineyard selection, age of vines being important, and you also talked a couple of minutes ago about well, they make wines for a certain type. You know, big, powerful, brooding production yield and stuff like that. What do you make wines for and how? What are you looking to capture? Well, the history of the place is, is really important. I, and I talked about that with the people. And my goal is to find, I own my own vineyards, but I don't own enough of my own vineyards. So what I do is I try to find small family vineyards, historical vineyards, 
that have been in the same family for a long time and they've been cast aside by the large corporations and growers that I've known for a long time when they used to grow for Allied or Beam or LVMH or Constellation or whatever. Right. And so that hopefully those guys call me and then I have a, you know, I create wines and brands just for their vineyard and I'll find other ways to market to help, uh, to help them out. Because to me, it, it, it's such a people business. But when I, you know, I'm, I'm always the Piedmont guy. I'm never the top of the hill guy. I don't like the hills because they're always thinner soils, hard to irrigate, expensive to run. I don't like the valley floors because I'm not a big guy on, on yield. Uh, maybe with Merlot, I like the valley floor a little bit because the soils, if I can get the loamy soil, which has got more water holding capacity, I'll go for that. But basically, I'm a Piedmont guy, mid-slope. Okay. And uh, then I look for, I like morning sun. So I like east facing slopes rather than west facing slopes because I want right. the morning sun, not the afternoon sun. I also the want the- Why? Why morning sun as opposed to late afternoon sun? Because the morning sun is cooler than the afternoon sun. The afternoon sun, you're baking if you're west facing, you know? And it's true in the Southern hemisphere too. The sun comes up in the same place. <laughs> well, most of the folks tonight are drinking the Hillary. So, and you mentioned you had a, a video of the Hillary and that vineyard. So talk, talk to me about yeah. why you selected that vineyard, how you came across that vineyard, why it's special to you. Well, the, the, um, I've been driving up and down Napa Valley for a long time. When I was at Simi, I had to report into Shandon because remember LVMH owned Moet Shandon, they own Shandon and they own Simi. So, and then when we got bought by Constellation, I had to report into, um, eventually I had to report into the office in St. Helena etc. So I know this area really well and every day I would drive up and down and I'd take temperatures of uh, 29 and Silverado Trail and then I learned a big uh, learned a big thing about Rutherford and that is uh, one of the one of the wineries that we bought for Constellation I'll, I'll leave the name out of it but uh, I was with the winemaker you know because I was chief winemaker for Icon Estates you know as some wineries you can google icon you can probably figure it out but the uh i'm standing in this vineyard with the winemaker i said dude these grapes are not getting ripe and he goes nick they never get ripe we have a water table one meter down yep you know they should be growing potatoes but because it's napa valley they grow grapes so i really looked hard at where i wanted to make wine now rutherford has a better reputation than oakville rutherford has the the, the rutherford dust and all that carry on but i'm a silky tannin guy so i prefer oakville so St. Helena, they get cooler, you know, because St. Helena is warmer, Rutherford, uh, Oakville, and then Yontville. Shandon is in Yontville. So the really interesting thing about Alexander Valley Napa is the way the vineyards get cooled. In the Alexander Valley, we have two gaps. We have Petaluma Gap to the south, and we have Skag Spring to the north. So in the evenings, the wind comes up, and the cool breeze comes from the ocean, and settles into the Alexander Valley. When I wake up in the morning, the fog is thick. In Napa Valley, this doesn't happen. In Napa right. Valley, the sun comes up, it shines on Mount St. Lena and drags the cold air up off Frisco Bay. So the cooling is a lot more different. And of course, the, cold, the closer you, the further, the closer you get to the equator, actually the cooler you get. I know it's kind of weird, but- Oh yeah. So Yonville is cooler than Oakville. So anyway, I chose Oakville and then I chose this particular. So we have five ranches that we work with in Oakville. This guy that owns this particular vineyard is one crazy mother. <laughs> and I really enjoy him. And I, it's hard to get my work done <laughs> when I go over there because he always wants to, to, to chat about the life and all this sort of stuff. And he's really eccentric. And uh, he just owns this beautiful piece of property that, which I'll show you on a video. And, and I really enjoy it, you know, and he's part of the, he's part of what we do. Excellent. So, okay, folks, we're going to try some more technology here. Nick is going to show a video of the Hillary Vineyard. You might recognize a neighbor. So uh, this is the, um, this is the bottle shop. Hillary is, so I have five children. Hillary is uh, my youngest daughter. And uh, this is the, hopefully you can see that. Right there is the beautiful Nickel Nickel Winery and their vineyard. And that's Hillary down there at that end. And there's Opus, beautiful Opus, out here in the Oakville, getting ready to pick Hillary tomorrow. Cabernet Sauvignon, Oakville, Napa Valley. 
This is what I've been trying to tell people. Hello, good morning. Nick Goldschmidt here, winemaker for Hillary Goldschmidt, Charming Creek Oakville Cabernet. What makes this vineyard unique? Well, the clusters, of course. Beautiful small clusters, open, and you can see each berry individually ripens. We have relatively low yield, but a balanced yield because the vineyard is so old. This vineyard was planted in the 70s. And we have nice organic material covering the vineyard. So we have never di we have not disked it in. And so we have a good buildup of organic material, which means better water penetration and better, of course, for the soil. Anyway, so beautiful Cabernet out here. Oakville, Hillary Goldschmidt, Cabernet Sauvignon in the heart of Oakville. And while I've got it, uh, Martin, I'll just show you the next video because it's pretty funny. This is uh, this is Hillary herself. <laughs> Ninety is there. That's that's ten. Ninety. Oh, there. Oh, sorry. So I I I have, I have many. Um, I have many videos with Hillary uh, blending, but that one was really funny because it goes to show her nature. Um, Feisty? She's, uh, yeah, she's a pretty sharp, she's a little, she's the sharpest tool in the shed. Well, one of the sharpest. Um, hey, no one's gonna see this, so don't worry about your other children. Um, <laughs> we've got like four listeners. All right, yeah, well, you know, I've, I've got these special kids. So no. what happened was the very first one we made was Chelsea. So when Chelsea was two, she, um, I traced around her head and then she colored it in and that's where the label comes from. And so the children, I was, I was explaining to my children that when I made wine in Chile in 88, if you guys remember in 88, uh, Pinochet was still in power. And one of the things that he did was he would cut the electricity off, he would cut the food off, he would cut the fuel off, whatever he chose to do at that particular time. So we used to make wine without electricity. So we started making wine, the five kids and I started making wine together. So we'd hand pick, we handy stem. Now handy stemming to do half a ton takes two days because you've got to pull all the berries off. The um, girls did the pijage. I've got great photos of them doing the pijage. The boys did the punch downs and then we hand bottled it and we called it five gold hands unplugged. And so the kids wanted to get involved. So we, we Chelsea, and then we made Catherine now we don't have three hands and I can't hold all of them up together, but we just updated the label. So the uh, girls now have a little bit more hair than they were a couple of years ago. But if I had the Hillary here. That makes, that makes one of us. <laughs> if we had Hillary here, Hillary and Chelsea face one direction, but Catherine faces the other direction because she's the middle child. You know what middle children are like, right? Liars, manipulators, bullshit artists, things outside the box. And that's why we love her. She's the penultimate salesman. And before like you go it. there, Martin, before Hillary, I go there. <laughs> Hillary is spelt with one L and all my, and nothing to do with Hillary Clinton, of course, because we have Chelsea. People give me a hard time all the time. But she's named after, it's a very funny story about Hillary because we thought she was going to be a boy. And we were going to call her Sean. And she tells this whole story. She pops out and I say, hey, Yolan, it's a girl. She goes, oh, Christ, what are we going to do? So um, we named her Hillary after Sir Edmund Hillary because it had to be a boy's name for a girl. So we chose Hillary. So Edmund Hillary, if you know, he's the first guy Everest. to Mount Everest and he was a New Zealander. So there you go. I did not know the New Zealand link, but I knew Mount Everest, absolutely. And there, there's nothing wrong with the name of Sean. It's, it's a very, very powerful name. It's, it's a wonderful name. It's, it's a, and Sean, we have, a, we have a Sean on the stream right now raising a glass who has consumed the Hillary. So. Um, Sean, sure. it's not named. It's not named after you. It's named after a different. But it's so. so I, I actually, it's, I find it amusing and, and and validating in a way because your video tells the story just in about a nine second clip. There's nickel and nickel. There's opus. Here we are right here, uh, and and that wine or those wines are X dollars. This wine is Y dollars, and but it is also. And I'm curious. That would be considered valley floor, yes? Yeah, but it's, um, it's, this is why we live in California, because California, Chile, Argentina, and New Zealand are all fault lines. I don't know what Australia and France are. They're big flat pancakes, and their soils are boring. But what we get is we can throw a stone, and we're a different soil type. Now, people, you probably don't know this, but the Russian River formed the Napa Valley, and the Russian River used to flow into San Francisco Bay. 
but there was an earthquake and Mount St. Helena got lifted up. And then there was another earthquake and a mudslide came off. That's what formed the Knights Valley and blocked the Russian River off. That's why the Russian River now flows out to the coast. Right. They call it the Russian River Valley, but we need like another 30 million years. The real valley is Napa. That's the real Russian River. So we have these different soils. And because we have these two big hillsides, we have the Mayakamas and the Jacksons and, the, and these uh, glaciers came off at that time and formed these river wash areas covered over with loam. So that soil that this vineyard is on is a loamy soil. Now, it's not too far away that you get into this deep fertile stuff. But I always say, look, when Kim Jong-un drops a nuclear bomb on California and you go to the bunker and you show up with one bottle of my brother's wines or three six packs of Hillary, who are they going to let in? <laughs> I like it. Let's hope that doesn't happen anytime soon. Although, side note, funny story, speaking of Sean, uh, we actually were in Hawaii several years ago with Sean when we received the Amber Alert ballistic incoming missile on our phones. You were there? Yes. <laughs> yes. So when the phones go off at 817 in the morning and you get that message and it ends with, this is not a drill, take cover immediately. You, you tend to put a few things in perspective, which is why we spend so much time drinking high quality wine and associated with great people. What is, like what is the, uh, it's gotta be astronomical. What is two questions for you that have come up in this, in the stream, um, both completely different. Have you seen an impact or are you noticing anything with climate change and grape growing viticulture? Question one, which I'm sure is a short answer. And then question two, <laughs> what um, cost per acre of, uh, or cost per ton, if you will, from grapes for Hillary? Right, climate change, yes, of course, huge. Uh, I don't call it climate change. I call it climate uncertainty. And of course, I'm a skier, so I notice uh, yeah. how much snowpack I get. <laughs> Right. Uh, so that's a big influence. And, um, you know, the Alps in New Zealand, Australia, are, uh, sorry, the Alps in New Zealand are bigger than Switzerland and Austria put together. And wow. we've had traumatic glacial loss, snow uh, uh, loss. Um, so, yeah, I definitely see it. And then in California, you know, I just read an article where this year is confirming that we are in the 150 year drought. Because if you look in the if you look over histo history, I mean, you, you, you know, it's all wiggly line, but if you look over a long period of time, it's a straight line. So yeah. we know this year, for instance, winter 2019, uh, and then rainfall into February, March, we know that uh, we've only had 13 inches instead of 42. So we're, uh, we had a lot of rain in 17, we had a lot of rain in 15, but the buds are formed two years before. So right now, we are confirming the buds for 2021 because our buds right now are about this big. And if you dissect those buds, we can tell you how many clusters are in there for 2020. And if you're really good, we can tell you how many clusters are in there for 2021. And that's, no and that's preset by the amount of water and spring conditions. Now the spring conditions here are very cold. So that probably means our fruit set for 2021 is not going to be great. Right. So we'll see. But, when, in the 32 vintages I've done in, Cal in uh, Napa, Sonoma, I've picked in August seven times. <laughs> okay? Seven times out of 32 years. And I, and, I, and I did this because I wanted to find out. And five of those years were 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Wow. It is getting warmer. It is getting warmer. How many times have you picked in October? Let's skip September. Oh, I pick October all the time. In fact, we used to pick in November. When I was, uh, when I was early on and, and see me, I mean, for the first 12 years, we always picked in November. We always, I always said, you know, we always have to pick up and we'll pick the last grapes the first weekend of November, through the first weekend of November. And, uh, and the only reason why that happens today is when we have a heavy crop, like, uh, 2013 and 2018 were both heavy crops. I mean, don't get me wrong, 2012. If you guys find a bottle of 2012, hang on. Best, best vintage in recent memory, man. I'll take 2012 any day. 
What was the second question? Something that I really didn't want to answer. I think it was. No, uh, it, it was uh, cost of uh, ton oh. of grapes between nickel and nickel, but, Hillary, and, and that small no, mom and pop operation called Opus. Well, let's face it. I mean, when you're buying an expense, Americans are, I find Americans very interesting because. And that water table, by the way, hasn't gone away. It's still there. Yeah. And if you put $100 on a bottle, they think it's worth $100. Correct. That's the funniest thing. That's all you need to say. Let's not go any deeper into that. I do, I do want to another right now. You're going to be the because our audience uh, goes to tastings quite routinely when they go out to the Valley and all of them ask questions. So you as a winemaker and experience, what is the worst question a customer can ask a winemaker? Is it, how much mallow does this wine receive? Is this 100% new oak? What level of bricks do you target before picking? All of the above, none of the above. Again, keep in mind, audience, these are the worst questions you can ask a winemaker. And I'm of the opinion, okay, we've got 22%. We're going to cut this off at about 70%, so we need about 30 more seconds. Um, a lot of times, Nick, I think these questions are asked as if the person asking the question wants to connote to the recipient of the question that they know what they're talking about when in fact what they're talking about has no freaking bearing on enjoyment whatsoever that's just my personal opinion all right we're almost at 70 oh, now we're at 72 percent. so we're going to end the poll and see what it is all of the above is the number one answer so which which of these questions if you could do are, are there bad questions are there Good questions. Talk to me about questions. Talk the to me about malolactic. The malolactic one is the worst one um, by far. It's uh, because, because people think, oh, but it's like how many tons per acre? It's like, uh, and then I look at the buyer and I go, hmm, what does he know? And if he doesn't know very much, I'll say two. <laughs> but if he understands the business, I'll say five or six or whatever. Because if you graph quality against tons, it's a bell-shaped curve. Right. All right. You can undercrop a vineyard as easily as an overcrop a vineyard. Right. So the bell shape, you don't know if does the bell shape look like this or does it look like that? And unless you understand where the grapes came from. And we don't talk about tons per acre, we talk about pounds per vine, because I could plant one vine in an acre and get four pounds. Does that make it better than a vineyard that has 2,000 vines on one acre? So with ML, uh, the reason why I use that is because ML is really complicated. In fact, here's a really uh -oh. funny chart. Look. I like it. A chart. We've got videos and charts. This is, somebody pissed me off earlier today. <laughs> so if you have malic acid and you go to lactic acid, so there's two forms of, I'm not going to bore you guys, but there's two forms of major acids, tartaric and malic. You add yeast, yeast ferments sugar to alcohol. We all get that. But there's a bacteria ferment. It's called Lactobus, uh, Leuconostoc onus. Leuconostoc By the way, uh, hey, Jeff Greasy, I, I know if you're still listening, I told you that's what the bacteria was called. Go ahead, Nick. I'm sorry. So if, you, if you're in a cool climate, you have four grams of malic. If you're in a warm climate, you have one gram of malic. You okay. add the bacteria, it's a half reaction. So the four grams of malic becomes two grams of lactic one gram of malic becomes half a gram of lactic. So which one's more buttery? Well, the cool climate one. <laughs> so the first thing, instead of asking how much ML is in your wine, you should say, is it cool climate or warm climate? Right. The second thing is, if, you, if you're fermenting sugar to alcohol, and then you add the bacteria, the problem is bacteria eat nitrogen quicker than yeast. And yeast need nitrogen to survive, and so they go into stress. And so the yeast start eating the butter because it's a nutrient source. There's a couple of there's a couple of OM elements hanging off the end of the benzene ring that allows this thing to happen. So it eats the butter. So if you add the bacteria during primary fermentation, less butter. If you ferment hot, less butter. If you mean if you leave the wine on lees and do the surly aging stuff, that that's another good question that piss, piss winemakers off. If you leave it on lees, it absorbs butter. 
And then, of course, you can screw it up by adding citric and malic, and I can make the wine more buttery than it ever was. So don't ask the question unless you understand the science. What was the yeah, second that's fair. I, I'm never asking that question again. Um, my, I think the question I'm going to ask is, is that bottle available to taste? That's going to be my, my question to you for when we taste. Is, and then speaking of the bottles, let's walk through your portfolio because it's extensive. And I understand, I mean, I mean what I'm drinking is the Forefathers and it's a Sonoma, Lone Tree Vineyard. Um, this is actually a Cellar Angels feature a while back. And it's a fantastic bottle of wine. You're drinking, and, and a lot of our customers right now on, on the uh, chat are drinking the Hillary, Napa. So you're a single vineyard guy. You want a single vineyard, you don't blend. Uh, walk us through that philosophy, and then walk us through what you're trying to get from Napa Sonoma, and, and what you're after, and how you know if you, you got it. Yeah, sorry, you're breaking up a little bit there, and I, and I ran out of power for a second. I went into a little joke. Um, That's okay. The, uh, everything we do is single vineyard, single varietal, single vintage, and vegan. So we call it the four Vs. And as I said, I try to, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we try we to make were just, most... We were just splicing and dicing chemistry of <laughs> yeast. How much more detail do you not want to get into? Well, you know, I don't want, I don't want people to like sign off. I see we've, we've lost some people already. Maybe it was your sense of humor. I don't know. Um, that, that happens <laughs> often. We have to blame it on you. Uh, so I started off, I mean, the top wines that we, I started off making Forefathers. Forefathers was the original. So I was on a plane going down to Cloudy Bay to make Cabernet Chardonnay, Merlot, Sauvignon. When I was the chief winemaker for Louis Vuitton, I was running Cloudy Bay, Cape Mentel, Tarasas in Argentina, Roses and anyway, a bunch of wines. Why am I going to Cloudy Bay to make all these other things? When you think New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc. When you think Australia, Shiraz. So we made a McLaren Val Shiraz out of Australia, Uco Valley Malbec out of Argentina, a, um, a California Cabernet and a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. I happen to have the Sauvignon Blanc here. And so we called it Forefathers because Forefathers means the premium appellation for that variety in the new world. Best single vineyard. This is before layer cake, cupcake and all the other bloody cakes that went global, but they don't do single vineyards. This is a single vineyard. Also on here is a pair of boots. You can't quite see it on here. It's a pair of boots that I used to wear when I walked around see me. There's writing on here. That's my constitution for being a, a, a farmer. I stole John Hancock's signature from the constitution changer to my own and wax size the name of the, wax size the name of the bird that eats all the grapes. So um, that was the first wine that we did in 1998. And then in 1999, we started making um, Goldschmidt, which is my top wine. Uh, so this one here, this is a Goldschmidt. This is uh, this one's from Game Ranch. This is from Oakville. So we make two wines. We make one from Oakville and one from the Alexander Valley. These wines are about the Alexander Valley is about seventy five. This is about ninety. And then we go up to the the plus the plus range, which is um, well. And then talk to me too while you're grabbing those seventy five and ninety. You don't make a lot of them. No, we only make uh, ten barrels. Then the black label is the next one up. So we only make four barrels. And then ultimatum is the last one, which we only make two barrels. But that was all great. But then when I went out on my own, I needed to do um, some by the glass. And that's when we started making wines with the children, with the girls. I don't make wines with my sons, but um, started making wines with my daughters. And uh, so that's, that's what led us into making Chelsea, Catherine and uh, Hillary. So. Now, you've got five kids. One of them is a winemaker. Uh, did you encourage, discourage? How did, you, how did he come to that conclusion that not, not, the apple not falling far from the tree, so to speak? No, I, 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 I wasn't a big encourager because I think the wine industry is really hard. And it's getting harder because... Um, the route to market is becoming really constricted. We could talk all day about that. That's why working with somebody like Seller Angels and your customers are really lucky to have a company like you who can go out and source small producers like ourselves and bring them to market. You know, typically wines that you wouldn't be able to find. So we really appreciate you partnering with us because we don't have a really good route to market when it comes to online. And uh, this is definitely the future. 
I think there's going to be two forms of wineries in the future. There's going to be the Negotion, the Constellations, the Treasuries, and all the big companies. And then there's going to be Farm to Gate. And so being in the middle, I think, is going to be very difficult. Right. And uh, so I think we're all realizing that with our current situation. And so, uh, yeah, this is, this is a great opportunity for me to meet people that I wouldn't normally meet. So, yeah. And it's a lot less expensive. Uh, granted, it's not first class because I know that's how you travel on Air New Zealand around the world and um, that sort of thing. You know, you talked about uh, how many barrels you just make of certain wines. And I think it's a fascinating thing because not many people know, and it's going to lead us to our third and final polling question, is, is how many cases are in a barrel? So, stop. 23 point, 23. Hey, boy, you, can't, you can't answer. You, you, oh, you're, okay. You're, you're the judge. <laughs> oh, it depends on the barrel. There's three different sizes of barrel. Um, we're not, there, there's, <laughs> no, there's no take home part of this. Okay, so how many cases of wine per normal barrel? 10, 25, 50. Martin said there'd be no math. <laughs> Look. Wait, uh, don't answer. Not yet. No, but it depends on the country because the, uh, the rest, you know, the rest of the new world use um, puncheons. Australia right. uses hogsheads and the U.S. use Greeks. And now we're using yeah. food rates. This is a trick question, man. This is a trick question. It's what we do here. I, I can't let everybody be as smart as they think they are. You're the smart one. I'm just facilitating okay. the knowledge pass. All right, we've got five seconds. Four, three, two, not bad, 66%. And American yeah, I'm gave it away, I guess. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I, I applaud the two people that said Martin said there'd be no math. I like that answer better. They're the winner. <laughs> so it's, it is interesting that you talked about barrel size, and, but, but I think that's kind of a, a way that folks in the United States, they hear, and, and this is, you brought this up earlier. It's like, well, is it vines per acre? Is it tons per acre? Is it pounds per vine? How many cases per barrel and stuff like that? When someone says on the back of a label, there's only two barrels made, what does that mean in the United States? And, and now we kind of know, uh, but it does let, people know that when you make two barrels, when Nick Goldschmidt makes two barrels of something from Napa, it's going to be pretty damn special. Yes. And, and so how do you decide what goes into that wine if you're only making 50 cases of it? I've got the perfect slide, but I, I'd have to like uh, backtrack. And so it depends no, man, that's a really complicated. How do I answer that question quickly? Uh, you don't have to do it quickly. We can do a part two. We'll, we'll be here tomorrow <laughs> at 9 a.m. with Bloody Marys. <laughs> Look, I learned when I was talking about the elegant, powerful, and dense, the dense wines are the really hard wines to make because the dense wines typically have really big canopies and small crop. And they're typically, and, and we can see that when we do aerials uh, over vineyards and we can see all that. But what, what is also interesting is that the outside rows, the out two or three, four rows of the vineyard always get more water and they have less competition. So they tend to be more vigorous. Okay, so well, they, let, let, me, let, me, let me just stop you there because you've hit on two things that I think uh, require a little bit more uh, exploration. I love your phraseology of elegant, powerful, and dense. And, and how that transfers on, on the palate and, and then maybe where that is in the vineyard. And you just talked about the vigor of the external vine. <laughs> oh, sweet, a teaching aid. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of this. So elegant, powerful, and dense. I usually call that uh, Sophia Loren. I, I won't go there. We, we violated a several HR policies already. All right, okay, so let's go. Elegant, oh, powerful, and dense. Okay. And when you take, when you, when you look at a vineyard, you know, um, the beautiful thing about making wine in California is we have all these different soils in there with these swales. And so this area here is different to this area here, which is different to this area here. And so we end up picking the three regions separately because when I started breaking the wines into families, I'd go, dude, where'd all the elegant wines come from? And then I realized they came from the same part of the vineyard every year. So then I thought, I'm going to start making these wines differently. So the, 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 there's only one 
chart that you really need to, uh, the Nick Gold, if you go on my YouTube channel, I've got over a thousand videos, you can see all this stuff, but one of them is labeled education. You can see uh, there's about 40 of these things. So it'll take you seven months to find the education video, but the rest of them are fantastic. It's, it's, it's Nick's, it's clickbait from Nick. Nick wants you to be on the website for literally seven months. All right, so if this is flowering, and this is harvest, okay? This is acidity. Acidity increases and decreases and get closer to harvest. This is called veraison. At veraison, we start to get an increase in bricks. Bricks is obviously what converts its sugar and it converts to alcohol. Bricks is a metric term. Again, don't use the word bricks unless you understand metric. Flavor starts off relatively low and increases if you get closer to harvest. And tannins move from green, dusty, dry, ripe. And where these three things meet in Bordeaux is 100 days. Hmm. Okay? Never happens. Because in a heavy crop, tannins take longer to ripen. And in a low crop, flavor takes longer to ripen relative to tannin. So when we pick, we have to consider how the tannins are tasting. So I'm going to give you one little, tr which tricky one shall I show you? Um, you can imagine if you go into the vineyard, so instead of 100 days in, in Bordeaux, we get an extra month of hang time. So in an elegant vineyard, the fruit is an always higher concentration than the tannin. So we want this distance to be really big. So we let this elegant wine hang out in the vineyard for longer. So we can have 145 days, a powerful vineyard, 135 days, and a dense vineyard. We know that the tannin is in higher concentration than the fruit. So we don't want this distance to be very long. So we pick it earlier at 125 days. And that was the tricky thing. I didn't understand because I go to the vineyard, it'd be green, dusty, dry, 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 raisin. I missed it. <laughs> because the curve, in the span of 24 hours or, or like yeah, a the week? curve was too tight, man, because these vines are too vigorous. Right. And so they suck water, suck water. When they run out of water, they suddenly okay. start pulling from the cluster because the okay. cluster is the only moisture it can get. And so it converts it into a raisin. And when yep. you make a raisin, that's a problem. Yeah, it's not so on the That's why you shouldn't drink Cabernet over 14.5 alcohol. Do not drink alcohol. Do not drink Cabernet. Most of these Cabernets in Napa Valley are 15, 16 alcohol. And when you drink them, because the alcohols are so high, because they've converted to raisins, you get fructose. Fructose is a very sweet sugar. So that's why people who drink Coca-Cola drink Napa Valley. It's the same stuff. Correct. That is an absolutely fantastic visual. And it's kind of funny, we've got a gentleman on the, on the chat who's an educator, uh, a gifted teacher and author and a chef as well. And so he appreciates all of the teaching aids and how to impart knowledge. So that has been fantastic. Speaking of, of tasting, if, if someone were to come to Napa or Sonoma and want to taste with you, how is that accomplished? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, or do we have a better those? chance of meeting you at the San Francisco airport in the uh, departures lounge? No, no, we have a, well, we're open by appointment here in the office here. We're in Healdsburg, so we're one hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, Healdsburg is a beautiful little town. It's the junction of Alexander Valley, Dry Creek, Chalk Hill, and Russian River, all meet in Healdsburg. Before the uh, situation we have currently, we have 38 restaurants, 9,000 people, and 220 wineries. So it's a great place to come visit. And our own tasting room, though, I actually live in Dry Creek, and so we have a it's called um, Timberland Farms, so it's, it's a little bit further out in Dry Creek, and we share a tasting room with a couple of other people. And it's a really cool place. It's called the Poor House. Uh, so we, we serve our wines with three other wineries at the Poor House. So it's, uh, it's, uh, that's the way to come and find us. But uh, again, if you send me an email, we can go on my website, goldschmidtvineyards.com, and you can see plenty of our other wines that we make. And a lot of, a lot of them are not available to the public. We only, I mean, to, um, to the three tier system. So you can only buy them directly from us. Um, yeah. So I, we really appreciate you guys supporting small family businesses like ourselves. And please send me an email at nick at goldschmidtvineyards.com. And for those of you on that have that are still on that have endured my sense of humor and Nick's teaching, uh, one of them is easier than the other. 
Uh, those of you that are wine club members, you might be treated in Q2, might, I'm not saying that uh, you will, but we're working on a deal with Nick. And most of you that are on right now recognize that the, the tasting kits uh, that you're all tasting the Hillary in and you're set for a couple of weeks, go onto the website on Monday and you can buy a sip tasting kit and it will have the next six wines for the next six Fridays in a row and you can taste along with the winemaker uh, such as Nick. I promise you it will highly unlikely be as educational as this uh, or as fun, uh, but we still try to make it engaging. Um, Nick, I, I can't thank you enough with regards to everything you've said, taught, done, <laughs> and, 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 and blessed us with, with regards to your presence. I, I'm in, enamored with your style. I, I love the grace, I love the passion, and everything you bring to the, to the craft of winemaking. And with God's speed, hopefully you're doing it for as long as you wanna do it because the results are absolutely spectacular, regardless of where you are. So uh, whatever country, whatever you know, AVA you're in, you're one of the tops there is. So thank you so much for sharing your evening with us. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules, uh, <laughs> drinking a glass of Hillary with me and uh, yeah, challenging times, but we'll get through it. And I really appreciate your support and supporting Seller Angels as well. They're a great partner and we really appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Everyone, everyone be safe. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next Friday. Take care. Enjoy. Cheers.